Hi, I'm Lois from the monthly meeting of Friends of Philadelphia here to welcome Paula Palmer. She will be talking to us about the Quaker boarding schools for indigenous people. She is joining us from Boulder, Colorado, and she has spent many years researching this topic. Paula. Thank you, Lois. And thank you, Lois, for our months of preparation and correspondence um, leading up to this evening. I appreciate the opportunity to um, meet with you tonight. And, um, and as you said, I'm joining you from Colorado. Um, this is the homeland of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute peoples, the Boulder Valley. The um, Boulder is my monthly meeting and my yearly meeting is Intermountain Yearly Meeting. Um, and I think most of you are probably in the land of the Lenape people um, in the Philadelphia area. So um, I'm going to be giving a slide presentation. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's hope that this, all yes. here we are. Are you able to see that? Yes. Okay, great. Well, um, I'm going to give this slide presentation and it's um, sort of a formal presentation. So if you would hold your comments and your questions until afterwards, that would be just great. And I will be very eager to hear from you. I will be very eager to um, have you offer your reflections on this, um, on the content of this talk. So I'll look forward to that. Um, I should say about myself that <laughs> before I start that um, I am the co-director of a program called Toward Right Relationship with Native Peoples, and this is a program of Friends Peace Teams. My co-director is Geraldine Dakota, who is Turtle Mountain Chippewa, and so we do this work together as Native and non-Native peoples. So I began doing research on the Quaker Indian boarding schools in 2015, when I was the Cadbury Scholar at Pendle Hill. I'm diving deeper into this uh, research now, and I'm thinking that it might eventually become a book. I'm also encouraging all the yearly meetings that funded and operated Quaker Indian schools to do research in their own archives and make their findings public. Philadelphia Yearly Meeting is one of those yearly meetings that supported um, the Quaker indigenous schools. So I'm going to be returning to this topic um, at the end of the talk. The reason I began this research is because Native American organizations were asking for it. The National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition is working to bring healing to Native American individuals, families, and communities that continue to suffer debilitating consequences of the policy of forced assimilation that was carried out by means of the Indian boarding schools. Healing processes are already underway in some native communities, emerging from each community's own healing traditions and responding to their own needs. But for healing to occur on a larger scale, the boarding school healing coalition is also promoting a national truth and reconciliation process. Last year, U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren and Representative Sharice Davids introduced legislation to establish a Truth and Healing Commission that would shed light on all aspects of the Indian boarding schools, why they were established, how they were funded and operated, what the impacts were on the Native children and their families, and how these impacts continue to be felt in Native families today. The Commission will also make recommendations for actions that can bring about healing. And I understand that Philadelphia Yearly Meeting will consider a minute um, in regard to this legislation at your annual sessions this summer. The policy of forced assimilation of Native children that was carried out by the federal government in collaboration with Christian churches, including Quakers, violates Article 8 of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples which states, indigenous peoples and individuals have the right not to be subjected to forced assimilation or destruction of their culture. Nation states shall provide effective mechanisms for prevention of and redress for any action 
which has the aim or effect of depriving them of their integrity as distinct peoples or of their cultural values or ethnic identities. The proposed Truth and Healing Commission in the legislation that I just mentioned would provide just such a mechanism of redress for the harms caused by the Indian boarding schools. It's very important for us to support this bill. The first step in truth, reconciliation and healing is truth telling. Back in 2015, the Boarding School Healing Coalition asked churches to bring forward our pieces of the truth, the history of each church's participation in the boarding school era. Now the US Department of the Interior under the leadership of Deb Holland is also asking the churches to contribute to the department's ongoing investigation. Starting this year, the Interior Department will conduct hearings around the country asking Native Americans to bring forward their testimonies, the experiences of students in the boarding schools and of parents, children, and grandchildren of boarding school students. The department will also review scientific studies on the effects of psychological trauma, like the trauma that many Native children experienced in the boarding schools. Studies are showing, for example, that such trauma can be passed from one generation to the next. This means that the boarding schools of the 19th century are still affecting Native people today. For Native Americans, the boarding school story isn't over. And that means that for Quakers, it can't be over either. We're part of the boarding school history. The important question for us today is, how can we now be part of the healing? My research has been in two phases. First was a two week field research trip in August, 2015, when I visited the sites of 11 Quaker Indian schools in Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and Iowa. Guthrie Miller of Santa Fe Friends Meeting accompanied me on this trip in the Quaker tradition of spiritual accompaniment. The field research was followed by four months of bibliographic research in the Friends Historical Library at Swarthmore College and in Haverford College's Quaker History Collection. I'll give you a little taste of my field research trip with some then and now photos. These are the families of Quaker teachers at the Kansa Indian School. Note the school building in the background. I took this picture of the remnants of the Kansa Indian School outside of Council Grove, Kansas. This is the Quaker Indian Boarding School for Oto and Missouri children in Nebraska. And this is a remnant of the building which has been preserved by a local historical society in Barnston, Nebraska. This is Fort Sill Indian School where Quakers taught Kiowa, Comanche and Apache children. And this is what remains today of the boys dormitory at Fort Sill Indian School. This is the Kickapoo Friends Mission and School built by Quaker teacher Elizabeth Test in the early 90s, 1890s, with her own money. And this is now the home of Brad and Christine Wood, Evangelical Quaker missionaries at Kickapoo Friends Center. Brad's parents served as missionaries here, so he grew up in this house. And his wife, Christine, is Kickapoo. I'm going to suggest that anyone who is not muted could mute themselves. I'm just hearing a little background noise, so that will help. So I've identified plus or minus 30 Quaker Indian schools that operated for periods of time between the years 1796 and 2006, a span of 210 years. Some of these were day schools and some were boarding schools. And I have to say plus or minus because it depends on how you count them. For example, there was friend Thomas Batty who kept trying to gather children in his tent while they traveled across the prairie with Chief Kicking Band's bird, excuse me, Chief Kicking Bird's band of Kiowas. Should we count his efforts as a school, although there was no um, brick and mortar? Some of the schools changed locations, some of them changed names, 
Some of them started as day schools and evolved into boarding schools and vice versa. Some of them were in operation only a few months. The longest run in New York was 86 years. I've divided the Quaker Indian school experience into three time periods. Before the Ulysses S. Grant presidency, and then during the Grant presidency, and then after the Grant presidency. The Grant administration is the key to this chronology because under President Grant, Quakers were hired to serve as Indian agents and to manage Indian boarding schools as direct employees of the federal government. This official collaboration sets the Grant administration apart from the earlier and later periods. So let's start with the first period before the Grant administration. The first Quaker Indian schools were in New York where friends worked among the Oneida, Stockbridge and Seneca peoples. In 1791, the Seneca chief corn planter wrote to Philadelphia Quakers saying, brothers, we cannot teach our children what we perceive their situation requires them to know. And we therefore ask you to instruct some of them. We wish them to be instructed to read and to write and such other things as you teach your own children and especially teach them to love peace. In response, yearly meetings sent small groups of friends to live first among the Oneidas and then the Senecas. They opened day schools for both girls and boys that operated for a few years amongst the Oneidas and several decades among the Senecas. In his review of this period, friend Rainer Kelsey wrote, quote, these schools were not greatly appreciated by the Indians and often had very few scholars, the boys school even being entirely without attenders at some periods. Seneca attitudes toward the Quakers fluctuated. At times, the people divided into pro-Quaker and anti-Quaker camps. In 1851, Orthodox friends decided to build a boarding school so they wouldn't have to in Kelsey's words, quote, depend on the caprice of the Indian children and their parents for attendance, unquote. In the boarding school, in addition to their classroom lessons, the boys were taught farming and industrial skills and the girls were taught homemaking. Their labor contributed to the maintenance of the farm and the dormitories. Teacher Susan Wood expressed the school's intent in a letter dated May 26th 1853, quote, we are satisfied it is best to take the children when small, and then if kept several years, they would scarcely, I think, return to the indolent and untidy ways of their people. This was the greatest fear of the Quaker teachers, that in spite of their efforts, the children might, quote, lapse hopelessly into the old, shiftless, savage life again in the words of friend Rainer Kelsey. The Tunisasa boarding school was in operation from 1852 to 1938, an 86-year an run, which was the longest by far among the Quaker Indian schools. Quakers believed in education. They had been building schools for their own children for centuries. They were very concerned that native people could be cheated and would be cheated by corrupt government officials and land-hungry, alcohol-toting settlers and traders if they could not speak or understand English. Quakers frequently accompanied the Senecas to treaty conferences to be sure that they understood the proceedings and the documents. Their schools emphasized the teaching of English language and literacy, along with elementary um, arithmetic and geography. Students who memorized entire chapters of the Bible were held in highest regard by their Quaker teachers. In the Haverford College Quaker collection, I held in my hands a ledger book from the Tunisasa boarding school. Teachers recorded the students' names, their parents' names, their addresses and enrollment dates. And there was a column for observations. Some of the observations read, ran away, ran away fourth time married a white man, sent home for persistent disobedience, went home when father died, 
went to Carlisle, mm. taken to Buffalo Hospital for TB treatment, graduated with honors, killed on the railroad while drunk, expelled for immorality, unable to adapt herself. In the early 1800s, members of Baltimore Yearly Meetings Indian Committee began visiting the Shawnee people in Ohio. Several friends stayed for periods of time to build grist mills and offer instruction in farming and animal husbandry. By 1822, they had built a school near Wapakoneta. They boarded an average of 10 to 15 Shawnee students there over a nine year period until the Shawnee were forced to move west under terms of the 1831 treaty. The Quakers vigorously protested the forced removal of the Shawnees from Ohio and also the Senecas from New York. Thanks in part to their efforts, the Senecas retained two out of four of their New York reservations. Failing to prevent the Shawnees removal from Ohio, the Quakers there followed the Shawnees to Kansas and built a boarding school for them there just across the Missouri River. During the first half of the 19th century, Christian missionaries from almost all the denominations fanned out across the West, establishing missions and schools, partially supported with funds allocated by the federal government to, quote, civilize and Christianize the Indians, unquote. This was the common terminology, civilize and Christianize, and it was the common goal of the churches and the government. For the other denominations, the first goal was to Christianize, to save souls. So their teachers learned native languages, translated the Bible, and converted native people to Christianity. By contrast, the Quakers' first priority was to, quote, civilize. They believed in biblical terms that the ground must be prepared before the seed is sown. A Quaker teacher to the Caddos and Kiowas, Thomas Batty wrote, Quote, it has long been my opinion that to present the sublime doctrines of the gospel to these untutored people without a preliminary work of preparation having been first accomplished might be comparable to casting pearls before swine or sowing good seed on the stony ground. It would not be likely to be productive of the best results. For the Quakers, preparing the ground meant changing everything about the native people's ways of life, their dwellings, their sustenance, their clothes, their hair, their language, their gender roles, their economy, their names, their marital, marital practices, everything, says Quaker historian Thomas Ham of Earlham College, except their religion. So while some of the Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Methodists, and Catholics taught native students in their own languages, Quakers insisted on English immersion, believing it to be a necessary prerequisite for the planting of the seed. Now we'll move into the period of the Grant presidency after the Civil War from 1869 to 1877. Upon his election, President Grant initiated a new policy toward Native peoples, which he called the Peace Policy, or sometimes the Quaker Policy. Quakers actually proposed this policy to Grant before he was inaugurated. Their goal was to end the Indian Wars west of the Mississippi, call back the cavalry, and spare the lives of both Indians and settlers. The government would make peace with the tribes that agreed to live on reservations, give up hunting, take up farming, and send their children to school. These conditions were written into the treaties. In exchange, the government would guarantee the tribe's security and deliver commodities and annuity payments on a regular schedule. President Grant would appoint Christian men, nominated by the churches, to serve as Indian agents on the reservations, ending the notoriously corrupt system of political patronage. The Indian agents would enforce the treaties and facilitate the work of, again, Christianizing and civilizing the native people. 
Quakers participated enthusiastically in carrying out the peace policy. By this time, the Religious Society of Friends had split into Hicksite and Orthodox factions. President Grant appointed Hicksite Friends as Indian agents on six reservations in Nebraska, and Orthodox Friends as agents on 10 reservations in Kansas and Indian Territory. Another 57 reservations came under the authority of other Christian denominations. The Quaker Indian agents hired Quaker teachers, both men and women, and they immediately started building schools. During the Grant administration, Quakers managed at least 25 schools on the Western reservations. Some were day schools, but most were boarding schools. Quakers much preferred and promoted the concept of the manual labor boarding schools, also called industrial boarding schools. In 1870, a visiting delegation from Ohio and Genesee yearly meetings reported, quote, it is the opinion of all the Quaker agents that the industrial school is the best adapted to the wants of the Indians. They will then be removed from the contaminating influences of the home circle, where they lose at night the good impressions they've received during the day. In the industrial schools, students spent half days in classrooms and half days working on the school's farms and in the dormitories and kitchens. Thus, they would learn practical skills and also contribute their labor, child labor, for the maintenance of the schools. Many native parents saw this practice as demeaning and would not send their children to these schools. Wilson Hobbs, a Quaker teacher at the Shawnee Boarding School in Kansas complained, quote, the boys did not like to work and the hardest part of my duty was to keep them at it. Malin Stubbs, a Quaker teacher with the Kansa people in central Kansas confessed that he spent more time chasing after boys who ran away from their labors than in the classroom teaching them. Think about what these schools were demanding of the children. For centuries, native men had been warriors and hunters. Women had been gardeners and gatherers. In the manual labor schools, the boys were forced to do the farming, women's work, and the girls were brought indoors from the gardens to the kitchens and sewing rooms. The children were required to overturn the gender roles of their tribes in a single generation. Quakers were very hard on native men who resisted becoming farmers. They described them as idle, lazy, good for nothing. They put the whole burden of accomplishing the gender role transformation on the children. Wilson Hobbs, teacher at the Shawnee Mission Boarding School in Kansas, gives this glimpse of a child's first day at school. Quote, the service to a new pupil was to trim his hair closely, then with soap and water, to give him or her the first lesson in godliness, which was a good scrubbing and a little red precipitate on the scalp to supplement the use of a fine tooth comb. Then he was furnished with a suit of new clothes and taught how to put them on and off. They all emerged from this ordeal as shy as peacocks just plucked. For a child's perspective on this experience, we have the school days of an Indian girl written in 1900 by Zikala Shah, a Dakota woman who entered White's Institute, a Quaker boarding school in Indiana at age eight. She wrote, quote, I remember being dragged out, though I resisted by kicking and scratching wildly. In spite of myself, I was carried downstairs and tied fast in a chair. I cried aloud, shaking my head all the while until I felt the cold blades of the scissors against my neck and heard them gnaw off one of my thick braids. Then I lost my spirit. Our mothers had taught us that only skilled warriors who were captured had their hair shingled by the enemy. Among our people, short hair was worn by mourners and shingled hair by cowards. I moaned for my mother, but no one came to comfort me. For now, I was only one of many little animals 
driven by a herder. Another common Quaker practice was giving the children English names. In one of her first letters home after becoming a teacher on the Iowa reservation in Nebraska, Mary B. Lightfoot wrote, oh. quote, tell H and C I have named two little boys for them. I'm giving them English names as I cannot think of learning theirs. I have named several children after friends in the East. When I get through, I will send a list. Friend Albert Green visited the Iowa reservation several decades after his stint as a Quaker Indian agent in Nebraska. Among the Iowas, he met whole families named Lightfoot, Hallowell, Folk, Green, and other prominent Quaker surnames. The same names, he said, as one would find in the meeting houses of Philadelphia. What did this renaming mean to the children? In his memoir called The Names, N. Scott Mamaday writes about the origin and meaning of his Kiowa name. My name is Tsoi Tali. I am therefore Tsoi Tali. Therefore, I am. The storyteller Podlok gave me the name Tsuai Tali. He believed that a man's life proceeds from his name in the way that a river proceeds from its source. I am. By taking away the children's I am, the Quaker teachers forced them to give up their very identity. Joseph Webster, the Quaker agent among the Santee Sioux, put it succinctly. The whole character of the Indian must be changed. In the Quaker schools, students would not be allowed to speak their own languages, wear their own clothes, answer to their own names, participate in tribal dances and ceremonies, or go on the buffalo hunts with their family. The Quakers saw it as an either or situation. You are an Indian or you are civilized. These were mutually excluded, exclusive categories. Of course, native people resisted. Peter Nabokov quotes a Kickapoo father telling a Quaker school recruiter, take that ax and knock him on the head. I will gladly bury him. I would rather you do that then take him to school. Indeed, when the government built a school on the Kickapoo Reservation, the people moved as far away from it as they could and rebuffed the efforts of the Quaker teacher Elizabeth Test for years. She wrote impassioned letters imploring the means to compel Kickapoo parents to send their children to school, even against their will. In 1894, she wrote, I know it will sadly grieve Kickapoo parents to part with their children, but every day's delay is of great loss to them. There is not one of their whole number who can speak English. In this condition, they are already surrounded by whites, are being defrauded of the little money they have, are tempted, and continual, are tempted continually with strong drink and are not disciplined to resist temptation. They often yield. And many who are not guilty are arrested and carried off to jail. Their ignorance renders them helpless. Feeling similar urgency for the native children to be educated, at least two Quaker Indian agents threatened to withhold a family's food, food rations if their children were not enrolled in school. Gradually, most parents acquiesced, as did the Kansas chief Alegawaho who said in 1871, white men are all around us and we are cramped and pressed on every hand. I believe my people will soon be impoverished. This I do not want to see. This is the darkest period of our history. Chief Alegawaho then enrolled his son in the Quaker school. The child would become the first Kansas chief known by an English name. Albert Taylor. <laughs>
The government, the federal government, paid most of the Quaker teachers' salaries, usually around $500 a year. Most of these funds were taken out of the tribe's annuity payments that had been established in the treaties. Some teachers were paid by Quaker meetings and organizations in the Midwest and on the East Coast. Many teachers wrote heartbreaking letters to their friends back home, describing the impoverished state of the Indian populations, and especially the children, who on many reservations were dying of exposure, starvation, and illness. Quaker meetings and organizations raised money year after year and sent literally tons of cloth, clothing, school and farming supplies to the Quaker run Indian agencies in the West. The friends who answered the call to serve as teachers did so at some risk to themselves and their families. During the Grant presidency, the Utes, Modocs, Kiowas, Comanches, Lakota, Cheyenne, and Nez Perce peoples were still at war with the United States. Lakota and Cheyenne warriors defeated Custer at the Little Bighorn in 1876 during Grant's second term. The Quaker families, as well as the reservation bound Indians, were vulnerable to crop failures, prairie fires, droughts, blizzards, malaria, and tuberculosis. Several Quaker couples buried one or more of their children in the dusty cemeteries behind the meeting houses. Some teachers used their own paychecks to purchase medicines, food, and clothing when the tribe's annuities didn't arrive. Teacher Elizabeth Test camped in a tent for months in order to nurse Kickapoo elders back to health. A Kickapoo child whom teacher Test had adopted at age three and raised remembered, on long drives in her buggy, teacher would wake, waken suddenly and check the reins, stopping right in the middle of the road saying, whoa, whoa, where are we? I never understood the fatigue that came over her with long busy days, winter or summer, rain or shine, never too cold or too hot to make the weekly visits to the Indians scattered for miles about. She slept in their wiki-ups and took care of the sick and those in need. Some of the Quaker teachers stayed a year, fulfilled their contracts and left. Others stayed until the ends of their lives and are buried in cemeteries among the graves of their native students. One such friend was Rachel Kirk who wrote, the work of friends among the Indians lies nearer my heart than anything else. It has been the greatest part of my life for 16 years. I have given up everything to it. Before we leave the Grant presidency, I want to go back to this slide to give us a sense of the impact of the Quake, that the Quaker schools had. During that eight year time period, children from these tribes were attending Quaker Indian schools. In New York, Seneca. In Nebraska, Santee Sioux, Iowa, Sac and Fox, Omaha, Winnebago, Oto, Missouri, and Pawnee. In Kansas, Kansas, Shawnee, Potawatomi, Quapaw, Kickapoo. In Indian Territory, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Kiowa, Caddo, Wichita, Seneca, Kickapoo, Absentee Shawnee, Potawatomi, Cherokee, Sac and Fox, Modoc, Quapaw, Ottawa, Miami, Peoria, and Iowa. After the Grant administration, Quakers gradually turned their mission schools over to the federal government or closed them. With passage of the Dawes Act in 1887, Native peoples lost their communal lands and were forced onto individual plots called allotments. All the unallotted land was opened up to white settlers who poured into Nebraska, Kansas, and Oklahoma. By 1895, Native tribes throughout the West had lost two thirds of their land, 90 million acres. The Quaker mission schools started filling up with white children. By the turn of the century, public schools were becoming available, 
the last Quaker mission school on the Western reservations closed in 1913. During the 1880s, Orthodox Friends managed two off-reservation boarding schools, one in Indiana and one in Iowa. White's Manual Labor Institute in Indiana is the only um, Quaker school where I found records of native students who were buried there. As you know, the Department of the Interior is gathering data on deaths and burials of native children at the boarding schools. So I have sent them these records. Orthodox Friends also operated one boarding school and five day schools on the Eastern Cherokee Reservation in North Carolina. In Alaska, Quaker missionaries established missions and schools among the Cake, Tlingit, and Kotzebue native peoples. By 1920, these schools were handed over to other Christian missions or to the government. In the 1880s, while Quakers were graduating, gradually laying down their own schools in the West, they enthusiastically supported the government's off-reservation schools like the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Pennsylvania. Several Quakers served as teachers at Carlisle and many Quaker families in Pennsylvania boarded Carlisle students during the summer months, putting them, them to work on their farms and in their households. The students' experiences in this so-called outings program varied. Some felt they were being used as slave labor. Others formed lifelong friendships with their host families. It's worth pointing out here a few differences between the off-reservation government boarding schools like Carlisle and the Quaker boarding schools. The Quaker schools were much smaller, except in the case of the Whites Institutes, they were located on the reservations, which meant that most of the children knew each other and spoke the same language. Their parents delivered them to the school under coercion, certainly, but at least the parents knew where their children were and could visit them at any time. The separation was not as extreme as it was in the off-reservation schools. I found no evidence of sexual abuse on the, in the Quaker schools, although I'm not sure where such evidence would be recorded if it had occurred. The Quaker schools were highly disciplined, but they were not run on the military model that governed Carlisle. The goals of the Quaker schools and the off-reservation government schools were the same, however to assimilate native children and eliminate native cultures. So how did Quaker teachers assess their accomplishments in the Indian schools? They could boast of some star native students, some of whom became defenders of the Indian boarding schools and proponents of assimilation. But most Quaker teachers despaired of having any lasting impact on their students. Wilson Hobbs, who taught at Shawnee Mission School in Kansas, sent some of his most promising, promising students to Ohio and Indiana to extend their education in hopes of grooming them to become teachers. But he complained, quote, the Indian traits were never sufficiently stamped out of any of them to make suitable examples for the children. Anthropologist Peter Nabokov wrote, to some degree, every tribe's person had to face the question of how white to become. No matter how much schooling the native children completed, in white society, they would never be white. In native society, could they ever be native again? Many children were deprived of the precious years of bonding with their families. They didn't learn the stories, songs, dances, games and skills of their people. Some of them didn't even have a name. The Choctaw poet H. Lee Corrales writes in the voice of a student who returns from boarding school. You're an Indian, my father said to me, go dance with them. He pushed my small body into the smiling rhythms, but I did not know them or my name. I remember his disappointment as I walked away from the crowds, embarrassed by his words. My father knew his name, but he never gave me mine. <laughs>
certain of the gains that awaited their students for becoming more civilized, the Quaker teachers could not comprehend the losses the children suffered as they became less Indian. Now to conclude this talk, let me see if I can summarize what I've gathered from the books, articles, letters, and journals of Quaker teachers in the Indian schools. Quakers saw themselves as the reformers of their time. They condemned the government's brutality and dishonesty in its dealings with the Indians and lamented the miserable conditions on the reservations. They called themselves friends of the Indians setting themselves apart from their fellow citizens who were urging the U.S. Cavalry to exterminate the Western tribes and make the continent safe for manifest destiny. They lived at a time when social Darwinism was becoming a popular way for European Americans to justify the decline of, quote, inferior races and the natural selection of, quote, superior ones. Against public opinion that said Native people could not be civilized, and would inevitably die out one way or another. The Quakers believed that native people could be civilized. They could be rescued from their quote, savage state and become quote, useful citizens. Quakers thought this transformation would have to come about through the children. Quaker teachers who started day schools on the reservations quickly lobbied for construction of boarding facilities to keep the children away from the bad influence of their parents and communities. They called the boarding schools homes. They called the residents of those schools, the Indian children and the Quaker staff, families, supplanting the children's Indian families. They gave the children English names and Western clothes, supplanting their native identity. They believed that they were doing this in the very best interests of the individual children and of the entire indigenous race. Quakers of the 19th century may have known that there was that of God in individual indigenous people, but they thought the tribal nations were failed societies destined to be replaced on this land by superior European Christian cultures. Indeed, Quakers held the same assumptions of European Christian superiority that were held by the Americans who were calling for the extermination of Indian people. The Quakers would not kill Indians, but for their own good, they would do their best to exterminate Indianness. Fortunately, they were not successful. Native people have kept 600 unique cultures alive throughout this land. The late Cherokee tribal chief Wilma Mankeller said, each time a traditional Cheyenne man engages in a Sundance or a Cherokee woman straps on terrapin shells and steps out into the circle to dance, it is practically a revolutionary act, a miracle, a living testament to the enduring spiritual strength of the people. Despite the best efforts of their teachers, 150 native languages are still being spoken and others are being revived. Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is learning her Potawatomi language for the first time as an adult says, it's almost as if the air is waiting to hear this language that had been lost for so long. This is one form that healing takes in native communities. Much healing is needed. The wounds in native families go back many generations. Through painful testimony and scientific study, we're learning how those wounds have afflicted generation after generation of native families and continue to do so now in the form of illness, depression, suicide, substance abuse, violence, and poverty. Echoes of the boarding schools are present today in the child welfare systems of many states where native children are systematically removed from their homes and put into foster care with white families. 
Native Americans have been suffering the consequences of the boarding schools for centuries. But finally, in the past year, the federal government has taken two important initiatives. One is the proposed legislation that I mentioned earlier that would create a Truth and Healing Commission. FCNL makes it very easy for friends to contact our senators and representatives and urge them to co-sponsor this bill. The other is the investigation that Secretary of the Interior Deb Holland initiated last year. The department is gathering information from every possible source to document the history and the ongoing impacts of the federal government's policy of forced assimilation of native children. One of those sources is the Christian denominations, including Quakers, that received federal funding to operate Indian boarding schools. Within the next year or two, the department will ask our yearly meetings to open our archives to their, investigation, to their investigators. I hope our yearly meetings will take responsibility for doing this research themselves and submit it voluntarily to the Department of the Interior. Friends Peace Teams is circulating a model minute asking yearly meetings to undertake this research in their own archives. I think Lois may have forwarded our model minute to you. And if not, we can still do that. And I'd be happy to discuss it with you. To conclude, I just want to say that I know it isn't easy to take in and reckon with this Quaker history. It has not been easy for me. But Quakers have been known as friends of the truth. And these are painful truths that we need to acknowledge. At the same time, I don't think it's our place, and it's not my purpose, to shake our fingers at the Quakers of past centuries. Our purpose is to know the truth and then hold a mirror to our own faces and ask, who are we today? How are we building right relationships with indigenous people in our time? So that is the end of my slide presentation. And I'd be happy for you to respond to these queries or any part of this presentation or any thought or suggestion or question that you might have. I'll try to see you. Um, but if I don't see you, maybe Lois can help me call on people if you'd like to raise your hand. Um, thank you for sharing. It's very sobering and uh, a lot to the process. Um, I'd like to speak to the last word, which is what can we do um, to uh, bring, uh, or I think it was uh, along the ideas of apologizing for earlier behaviors. At least um, acknowledging the harm. Yes, exactly, that's it. Right, telling the truth about, um, yeah, I, that's what I'd really like to ponder. Think about. Susanna, Susanna? Hey, I'm, I'm wondering why Quakers went along with this, um, this idea of um, assimilation. I mean, this, this, this was certainly, happening in Australia too with the Abor Australian Aborigines. In fact, it was continuing in Australia um, even when I was in school. Um, but I, I imagine not all Quakers thought it was a good idea or, or did they? I mean, this was, this was a popular decision. <laughs> 
I, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around Quakers from Philadelphia rushing and telling uh, and, and, and telling these kids that they couldn't be who they were anymore. I mean, that to me is just astonishing. Well, in the four months that I spent in the Quaker um, libraries, I looked, I looked and looked and looked and looked for someone in those files who would challenge that notion that Quakers and others who were operating the boarding schools were um, doing a favor to the children. And I did not find it, Susanna. It may be there, you know, I have to, I, I, I have to give that disclaimer that um, I didn't read everything. Um, and this is why it's so important for the yearly meetings to do this research themselves. Um, because I'm, I certainly may have missed something. I would be the, I would be the happiest among us if I, if we were able to find um, friends who, who um, challenged that, that idea that native societies were dying out and that the way to rescue the children was to make them like us, make them as, as much like us as they could be. There were many, many statements that I read um, in letters and journals of Quakers um, full of this notion of we are bringing the, the benefits of our culture and our religion to um, children who otherwise have no real future because because their native societies are failed societies. You know, the, the, the language for this is white supremacy. This is, this, this is the language of white supremacy. It's also an acceptance of the government's propaganda. You know, it's, you know the, the government was presenting a point of view which we know is false, but it had the government's imprimatur on it and their uh, view of the evidence was what people saw. They never heard any other point of view. And well, I think the, the material that I was reading was what Quakers who were teachers in the schools and supervisors in the schools, it was Quakers own observations and their own aspirations. Those, that's what I was reading. It, to me, it just sounds like the British Empire, which is incredible. <laughs> we got rid of them, us, me, right? And oh, and Susanna, I was going to say um, in regard to Australia, the the residential schools in Canada and the um, and the residential schools in Australia and New Zealand were based on the um, the experience in the United States. The United States boarding schools were the first, and they set the pattern for the other those other countries. This is awful. They're awful results. Mm -hmm. Rich, are you are you raising your hand? Yeah, uh, I'm just wondering, uh, is there any history during that same period of time of Quakers uh, speaking out against what was otherwise happening to the Native Americans during that, that time of uh, counteracting the, uh, in, in other ways, the idea that they should be exterminated or that what was going on with the reservation system was unfair and promises were broken. Uh, is there any history of that uh, during that time uh, from a Quaker point of view? 
there's lots, Rich. Um, Quakers spoke out. Quakers engaged with the government regularly. Um, Quakers wrote memorials, um, which I think we would call minutes or they sent what were called memorials to the president. They did it all the time. They engaged very much in, um, in the discourse, in the nat national, national discourse. Um, and they were very critical of government policy and they were extremely critical of the, the, the corrupt um, agents, Indian agents and traders and settlers in the West, um, especially those who drank alcohol and those who, who cheated um, the, the indigenous people. Yes, Quakers were very outspoken um, a, a, about those abuses. And they were very clear that, they're, that, that they supported the reservation system um, as in, in order to, it, it's, I think, I don't know if they would use this word, but I would call it pacify the indigenous people. They wanted to stop the wars, and this and the wars were ongoing. Um, in, in you know up until 19, 1890, um, at Wounded Knee, there were there were many indigenous um, nations were still at war, and. So Quakers wanted to make the conditions on the reservations better so that the quote, and I'm using language that they use, the savage Indians or the wild Indians, those who had not been brought onto the reservations yet, they hoped that they could be enticed to accept um, being confined on reservations but in order for that to happen, the conditions would have to be um, improved on the reservations. So they advocated strongly for, uh, for that improvement. Mm -hmm. um, but they, the solution that they, the, the solution that they um, came up with was assimilation. Yeah. Yeah. To, to back up uh, Paula on this, of course, <clears throat> most of the time, the uh, uh, each reservation had an agent that was controlled the reservation and reported uh, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and most of those, by far, most of them were there to make money uh, mm -hmm. of their own on that. Mm -hmm. And the work Quakers who did actually take that role and did, um, you know, a much better job. And if, and if I can just add on this to this a little bit more, Paula, um, up until actually Richard Nixon, um, they, um, <clears throat> the tribes themselves did not have any control over their reservations. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it was a, a law uh, that was pushed by and backed by Richard Nixon um, that actually gave reservations their control. My tribe got its governor uh, to do that. But then, and another kind of, I guess you think of this as assimilation in the 60s, Indians were, <clears throat> uh, were encouraged sort of funded to uh, leave the reservation and go live in urban areas. And, but they did not have, uh, they didn't have the education, they didn't have the skills or needed to find jobs to, um, to support them well. Um, <clears throat> and the Baltimore uh, yearly meeting um, still runs uh, a center for American Indians uh, that they set up in the 60s to be of assistance to these Indians who were told to um, uh, move into the cities and uh, assimilate and have better jobs. Yes, thank you for clarifying all of that. Um, and Susanna, I'm 
also uh, responding to your mentioning that um, in Australia, the schools continued up until our own lifetimes. That is true in this country too. The policy of forced assimilation didn't change until the Nixon administration in the 1970s. And um, that change came about as a result of the um, American Indian Education Act um, and, and the one that Mignon um, just mentioned, the uh, Self-Determination Act. Those were major policy changes during the Nixon administration. And I, I would say too, that those policy changes came about through tremendous pressure from indigenous um, tribes and organizations, um, legal firms like the Native American Rights Fund advocating um, with their um, native attorneys, but also the American Indian movement and the Red Power movement. These were, it, um, these were the, the social movements, the social cultural movements of indigenous people that brought about change finally in the 1970s. That's fascinating because that that's that was the same thing that was happening in Australia. Mm -hmm. Susanna, can you speak louder? Yeah, it was the same thing that was happening in Australia in um, 1967. There was a an, a referendum throughout Australia, um, and and the question was whether Aboriginals should be given citizenship. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was in school and everyone was just appalled that, that, that they weren't citizens. And, and it passed, of course. But, um, well, that's the thing. Things were going on in the United States and the Biafran War was going on, Vietnam War was going on. Everything was, was, was happening then. That's very interesting. Ah. So it's the same. Well, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about um, this um, initiative that Friends Peace Teams has taken, um, which has also been endorsed by Quaker Earth Care Witness and by an organization called Decolonizing Quakers. These three organizations are um, really urging all of the yearly meetings that were involved in the boarding school era to do this research um, themselves and then um, submit it to, uh, provide it to the Department of the Interior for their, for their um, work. Are, are any of you going to be going to your annual sessions? And is this something that um, you think might, um, might be undertaken by your yearly meeting? Well, I guess I would like you to think about it. <laughs> we should all go to annual meeting. Mm. <laughs> Yearly meeting, absolutely. Yeah. And um, Lois, I think I uh, had sent you that model minute. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to circulate that. I, I did send that to the arch list. And because the arch list sometimes loses attachments, I also uploaded it to my Google Drive and sent the link to that. So if people couldn't get the attachment, they could download it. Well, um, I'm, I'm glad that you're making that available. It would be good for, for those of you who are thinking of going to your annual sessions. Um, to take a look at it, and it's a model, you know. It's um, it just means here's something to think about and um, and to um, put into your own words. Something I, I kind of like to reflect on. You mentioned earlier in your talk that there were tribes that asked for help to teach their people to do arithmetic and learn English because they were being taken advantage of. And I think had the entire education limited itself to those few goals, we wouldn't even have this problem today. The, um, the quote that I read you, that beautiful quotation by um, Chief 
corn planter of the Seneca, where he says, yes, and teach my children to love peace. You know, that's the sort of thing that just warms the heart of every, <laughs> of every Quaker. Um, but I also read that years after that, um, Chief Corn Planter changed his mind about the schools. Um, and the Quaker schools were not the only schools among the Seneca. There were other, there were other mission schools there as well. But he, he wrote um, later that the trouble was that when they sent their children to these schools, they came out of them not knowing how to live, not, not knowing how to live as Senecas. They, they, they were useless as hunters. They were useless um, in terms of carrying on the, the, the traditions, sitting in the councils, making the decisions in the way that native people traditionally make them because they were no longer, um, well, because they had been schooled into this um, entirely different way of thinking and way of, of living. So Corn Planter changed his mind about the, the value of the schools for native children. They were probably schooled to be dependent on a very strict authority above them, and that wouldn't lead one to be able to make decisions in a council of equals very, very easily. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you Are, one thing. Um, I just um, came back from Intermountain Yearly Meeting, and um, I was I was very pleased there. Our our keynote speaker was Ernest House Jr., who is Ute Mountain Ute, and um, he gave a marvelous, um, very informative talk about um, the history of the Ute people in the region of Intermountain Yearly Meeting, Utah, Colorado, um, Arizona, New Mexico. Um, and he said that, and he talked about the boarding school history there. In fact, he told us about and showed a photograph of his father who had been kidnapped and taken to a federal boarding school and um, eventually ran away and was able to um, hide out and, um, and escape the, um, the boarding school that he had been sent to. So, um, Ernest spoke very movingly, very emotionally about the boarding school experience of, in his own family. And then he said that the Ute Mountain Ute tribe had very recently established a charter school on their reservation, whose goal is to teach the Ute language and teach Ute ways, teach Ute skills, Ute um, stories, Ute songs, Ute dances, teach Ute culture in, um, in all of its forms. And I am why I'm friends, I think, will be very motivated to support that school. Um, and I, this is something that I hope, this is something that I hope all friends will consider as sort of a direct form of reparations, understanding that our Quaker schools aimed to eliminate native languages, a direct form of reparations is to support native language education programs. And so I, I hope that friends will um, become major donors to, um, to support native language programs. Um, to again follow up on this, uh, Paula, I think that if you look at the American Indian colleges, um, of which there are none quite a few, mostly in uh, Montana, North and South Dakota, um, but uh, several other places. And these are colleges set up by the tribal nations themselves, where the president is um, a, um, uh, an indigenous 
um, person and the faculty is and what their goal is um, uh, if you look again over the past um, hundred years, you have uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, hiring people to come in and be the teachers, the nurses, the nurses, the counselors, um, uh, whatever, coming from off, off the, the reservation to do this, all white people. And that left few jobs on the reservation uh, uh, for this. But now, if you graduate, uh, they have nursing programs in these colleges, uh, counseling programs. They all teach courses on their, their tribal heritage so that you have people who can fill these jobs, yeah. stay on the reservation, and actually earn an income that otherwise would have gone to an outside person. Thank you. Yes. I was wondering if there's any... Uh anything going on at FGC meetings about about this uh, topic? Well, you know, FGC doesn't have business meetings. So um, FGC during during our um, annual gathering, excuse me a second, we um, we don't do business. So mm -hmm. I don't know if there is a mechanism for for FGC to to organize around this, um, I think in terms of business, it's the yearly meetings where this conversation needs to happen. But I will also say that FCNL has been just fabulous in in their advocacy on a number of um, Native American issues. The they they have advocated so strongly in regard to the. Um, missing and murdered um, Native people. And well, if you go to the FCNL, Native Americans under their under issues, if you click on Native Americans, you will see actions that you can take to support um, legislation that is important to Native people. And among them, um, um, among those actions are, um, is this bill that, um, we really need to get all of our senators and representatives to co-sponsor this bill and um, see if we can get it through through Congress. You know what a challenge that will be, um, but um, but it's just it's it's so important to create this ongoing um, process for truth and healing. Well, I wonder if we have pretty much come to the end of our time. You've been very gracious <laughs> um, in inviting and and listening to this presentation, and I've appreciated your I've appreciated the conversation um, and your thoughts. And um, I'm certainly available, and um, would be happy to hear from anyone. My Email address is Paula, and then the initial R, Palmer, no punctuation, Paula R. Palmer at gmail.com. And um, the, the URL for my work in Friends Peace Teams is friendspeaceteams.org slash, and then the initials TRR, that stands for Toward Right Relationship. So friendspeaceteams.org slash TRR, and you'll see um, a lot of materials related to this work. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. It was very illuminating. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula. You've done such a, a really wonderful um, a piece of research and bringing this to the attention of what Quakers did during the 19th century, thinking they were doing good things. Well, there's much more research to be done. Um, and I'm glad that my work has at least been the beginning of that. <laughs> Thank you, friends. Thank you.